My name is Dr. Brian Horseman. I work at a large multi-specialty ophthalmology practice in Phoenix, Arizona. So I was one of the early adopters using the 810 nanometer red laser. Obviously one can use both and there are some doctors strongly prefer the 810 nanometers. My reasons are as follows. The red laser penetrates more deeply. It affects the choroid, which we don't particularly want in most of our applications. I was trained initially to titrate the power, so you start with a barely visible burn with the 810 nanometer and then go down to a 10% or 15% duty cycle, which gives you the micropulse. That's certainly possible, but if in those that are heavily pigmented, in my area, well over a third of our patients are Hispanic background with a lot of pigments, so that's a difficult laser to use, and I much prefer the 577. It's targeted toward the RPE, it's not targeted toward blood vessels, it's minimally picked up by red cells. I was doing upwards of 50 injections a day. The patient that's sent to me rarely has no pathology. That's simply not part of the deal. So when I see a patient with diabetes, they usually need treatment of some sort for macular edema. Just as an aside, I have not found that pharmacotherapy with any of the three intravitreal agents is terribly effective for macular edema. Does it reduce the swelling? Yes, it does by a certain amount that may be significant statistically, but it does not dry the macula in most cases. Having found that over the past you know, multiple years since injections came out in 2005, I always add micropulse to those patients today, even if they respond because it keeps them dry longer. So one injection of whatever, of Aston, a Flibercept, whatever I choose, and then on to micropulse. Yeah, I was doing 50 plus injections a day, I now do five or six a day. The majority of patients I see back in follow-up at four months after the laser, the first visit, and after that is every six months, do not require any more injections. They are totally dry. I treat the majority of vascular diseases that we see, which includes wet macular degeneration, obviously, vein occlusions, diabetics. There are occasionally you know, more rare conditions like angiomas, things of that nature. At the very least, I'm not causing any tissue damage. And that, to me, is a major aspect of micropulse. There is no visible damage. The fluorescein shows no damage. ERG, VEP, whatever test you choose, including micropermetry, shows normal function of the retinal tissue after micropulse, and that's incredibly important. I almost always start off with one injection. And then I add micropulse in as pretty much 100% of the time, with a few exceptions. Occasionally, a, a vein occlusion that's not ischemic, an early one will respond well. I'll stop there. But the vast majority of diabetics, by angiography, have at the very least moderate, if not severe, ischemia. What that means is the few vessels that are left, if they're still leaking, are badly damaged and you need to find a way to control that. So although the micropulse we think is targeted toward the pigment cells, I personally believe it affects the microscopic vasculature as well. And by some mechanism, which I don't fully understand, helps to stop it from leaking. So that's a very important point for diabetics and for vein occlusions too which often respond poorly to injections. Because everybody wants to see better, obviously. If you're in your 50s to 80s and you're seeing 20, 70, that means you can't drive. What I try to tell them is I cannot make you see better in most cases, but I can help you see longer. So if you're 65 and retired or about to retire, at 75, I expect you to be seeing about the same as you are now. With things like diabetes, the the ischemic macula simply cannot function at the level it once did. It's simply physically impossible. But if they're still seeing the same 2070 or 2060 in 10 years time, I consider that a major victory. Otherwise, the decline in vision is inevitable and permanent. But if micropulse can stop that, and it seems to on a short-term basis, then I think that's a very important point for them. By and large, physicians are very resistant to change. That's not always bad. There are a lot of therapies out there that don't work that well that may have dangerous side effects. However, micropulse does not fall into that category. So with my experience over the past 15, 16 years, I can assure them that at the very least, you're not gonna hurt anybody. I think time and education, perhaps following doctors around like myself that do the treatment might be useful for those that are skeptical, but there will always be some people you simply cannot convince. <laughs> it's just that simple. <laughs> At the very least, with the lack of adoption of micropulse at this point across the board, I don't know how many doctors do it or don't do it, but I'm guessing that it's way less than 20% that actually use micropulse in their daily clinical practice, at least in North America. The target audience in North America is probably the problem child at this point. That we may want to modify if we can to help them adopt a really helpful therapy. It's not a question of income or money or success or lack of success. It's a question of 
can you help a patient that has no other options? And the answer is you can. That's really exciting and really important. I've used the Iridex lasers for approximately 16, 17 years, and my experience has been positive. I think the tech support is good. Uh, they give a replacement laser when the laser does go down, which all lasers break, all things break in time. We have lasers that are close to 20 years old from Iridex, and they're still functioning, still ongoing. I think the product is good and it's well supported, so I appreciate that greatly. I would describe MicroPulse technology as a great technology. 